For those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Trevor Rook. I'm the, the pastor here at Neighbors. And we've been doing a series called Resist. Actually, I'm going to give you a little secret here. Um, the things that we've been resisting in this series are the opposite of our uh, values. So we are, one of our values is love. So the first series, uh, sermon in the series was resisting hate. We've been, uh, we value inclusion. So our topic was resisting exclusion, right? Some of these, some of the opposites where we had to use like Google and all this kind of stuff. And this one is, what is this one? It's, oh, this one was easy, but hard to say. Uh, it's actually disingenuousness. <laughs> There's no way that you can say this uh, without looking stupid. And so we're going to talk about being genuine today. Being genuine. And the best way to talk about anything uh, for me, especially on Sundays, is to talk about what Christ did, because Christ is the very uh, reason why I am here. Um, our church, we, we follow Christ. We believe in Christ. We think that the stories that Christ uh, has in the Bible are stories that we can use as an example on how to be a little bit more Christ-like. The reason we call our church neighbors is because Christ tells us that one of the greatest commandments is to love God with all your heart, soul, and to love your neighbor as you would yourself. That's why our mission statement is to love God, love yourself, and love your neighbors. We believe that by being Christian, it's not just about believing, it's more about emulating Christ. It's more about sharing the love that Christ has, paying that forward, uh, feeling the love and grace of Jesus Christ, but then paying that forward in some way. And genuineness is, is a thisness. I can't say it. It's never going to work out. I'm never going to be able to say this word at all. Um, but that's a great way for us to show our, our inner Jesus, if you would. Every one of us uh, has, has Jesus inside of us. I truly believe that. Even uh, your, your, your staunch believers and your staunch disbelievers, Christ is in us. I really do believe that. I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, surrounds us. I believe it continually sends us messages in our lives. And we have a choice on whether or not we want to receive that and what we want to do with that. And so I believe that Christ is here. I believe he's with us right now. Um, I believe you stole his banana. He's a little upset about that, but it'll be all right. He really had his eye on that banana. So, um, did anyone try the kolaches? Julian brought kolaches today. Maybe, aren't they great? Yes. Thank you, Julian, for bringing that. Genuineness. The book of Mark talks about... Uh, it's believed actually to be the very first book of Jesus. Uh, the stories, if you, if you go to the Bible, you're going to see in this order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Mark is believed that it was actually the first gospel written. It's the shortest. If you ever want to just kind of a preview of the gospels, if you haven't read them yet, go to Mark. It's going to be um, full of action, and it's very short. And that's what actually the, the first gospel I ever read was Mark because I hate to read, so I just went with Mark. So, one of the stories in, in the book of Mark talks about Jesus spending some time at people's houses. And this is the, one of the things that I just loved, is that Christ was approachable. I cannot stress this enough. So many times in church, uh, we talk about God being way up there and in a distance and, and just not very approachable. Well, that's not exactly what it is. It's exactly the opposite of what that. And Christ was trying to show us that in these stories by saying, I'm going to eat at your house. I'm going to come to your house. We're going to share a meal together. If I come, if, if I, if I, if I come to your house and share a meal, I'm not way up there. I'm not just un, unapproachable. I'm at the table with you, and we're sharing stories together. We're learning how to be friends with each other. That's what Jesus was doing in the Gospels. That's, what, that's the whole point of that. It wasn't a sneak peek of, hey, now you see me, now you don't. It was, I want you to know that I'm approachable. I want you to know that I love you enough to spend time with you and to come to your house. I want you to know that. And sometimes he would even break the rules when he did that kind of stuff. There were times when uh, the Sabbath, uh, we call it Sunday, church Sunday. Uh, the Hebrew faith, they called it the Sabbath. 
uh, their actual day of celebration is the celebration of the Sabbath, Obser observation, not really celebration, because celebration would have taken energy and you're not supposed to do any kind of energy on the Sabbath. It was on a Saturday. And on Saturdays, you weren't supposed to do anything. You weren't supposed to work. Uh, you weren't supposed to harvest. The only thing that you could do is if uh, one of your animals on the farm got into trouble, you could help them out. But there was, even, um, there was even arguments of whether you could do that if that was a human being. Big rule day. And Jesus used to heal people on the Sabbath. And that really upset some people because he was messing with the rules. If he saw somebody that was in need, he didn't care what day it was. If he saw somebody that needed help, needed love, needed understanding, he didn't give a hoot of what day it was, where he was, or who the person was that he was helping. Sometimes he helped people that weren't even of the same faith as him. That shook a lot of heads. That upset a lot of people. Because in the Jesus time, in the first century, the people that uh, are starting this uh, Jewish faith have learned all of their lives that if you're in, in the Hebrew faith, you're loved by God. But if you're not, if you're not born of this faith, God doesn't really like you. And so in some cases, you weren't even to associate with those folks, let alone heal them. And Christ did that. Christ healed uh, children. He healed uh, slaves. He healed uh, man, woman, child. He healed people of uh, Jewish faith. He also healed people of what they would call pagans, pagan faith, outsiders, us. You see, we're, we're known as Gentiles now. But back then, we were known as heathens and pagans. We were known as the outsiders. We were the refugees. We were the outsiders. We were the people that the people of a certain faith wanted to protect by building a wall around their area. And it's true. You go to Jerusalem now, you'll see uh, that there were walls erect. It was to keep people like us out. And then we got in, ruined everything. Christ didn't care. Jesus didn't care. You need something? I'm here to help you. We'll talk about your faith and all that stuff later. You need something? Yeah, you're a sinner, but I'm here to help you. We'll talk about that later. Do you need something? I just want you to know I love you. I, and I don't care where you're from. I don't care what day it is. I don't care who you are. Because who you are is who I love. That was shattering the rules. That was making a lot of people very, very uncomfortable. How dare you do that? Do you realize that you're messing up all that we have been taught for over a thousand years? You're telling people that they can be uh, somebody else of a different life, different lifestyle, different uh, income, different nationality, different race, and you're going to love them as much as you love us? I'm not sure I find that comfortable. And some people started to spread stories about him. And it happened one time in the book of Mark where Jesus, not preaching in a church, not sitting on a throne, but sitting at a table with a family, in a home. And people had heard about him because before that he had been healing people and saving people and word got around. And so people started to come into this home. It was a packed house. And he was there with his disciples, loving people. And whoever wanted to come into that house was welcome. Anybody could come into that house and talk to Jesus. Imagine that. We think that Jesus is something that we have to sit on our knees and pray and close our eyes and do something that maybe rhymes or sounds Victorian or Shakespearean in order to speak to Jesus. Stupid. We've been stupid at times. We really have. Again, if we were to go to the actual scriptures, Christ is just sitting and talking to people. Hey, how's it going? I'm Jesus. Can you imagine that? Well, people may, were, 
were very elated about that. They were ecstatic about that. They were seeing the walking God. They were seeing the true Son of Man. They were seeing the Savior. And yet some people found that very, very discomforting. They did not like what he was doing. They would be okay with it if he changed just a couple of things. If you could just tweak a couple of things. If you could, if you could preach the peace, that's fine. But don't, don't talk about forgiveness for our enemies. Because we're being persecuted right now by the Romans right now. We're, we are a group of people that is under siege of a great a government very violent government, and you're telling us to forgive them. That makes us uncomfortable. Can you just leave that part out? Just talk about, you can talk about love and peace, but only about our people. The people that are out there, don't, let's not talk about welcoming them. Just talk about, uh, we're kind of comfortable in our inner group here. Tell us how great we are. We like that, but don't make us think outside the box. Don't make us think so casually about love and grace. We like to have conditions on it. We like to have that you have to be a certain way to be in our inner circle. Just preach on that. But he refused. Many times he just laughed him off. Because as he was preaching by example, he continued to meet people where they were in life. And he continued to heal people regardless of who they were in life. He continued to reach out his arms to everyone. And people started to spread stories about him. They started to tell people that this is a guy that is drawing out demons out of people because he's a demon himself. That's the only way that he could do it. If he is showing kindness and everything like that, he must be Satan. <laughs> Imagine that. Blanket grace. And they try to tell you that you're the devil himself. You spend your time sharing love and keeping those doors open, and people try to tell you that you are evil. Even his family. Do you know Jesus had a family? That's another thing. We think this high throne guy sitting on a cloud, uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. And when Jesus was preaching, they thought he was nuts much like my family does to me now. <laughs> of course, they always thought that before I was preaching too. But They did. They thought he was nuts. And as a matter of fact, they were worried about him. And in this house, he had not eaten for a while, and they were actually knocking at the door wanting to rescue him from this because they thought that he had kind of lost his mind. Because they too were raised on the, 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 the law and the rules of the faith. And Jesus was breaking ground on this stuff. Anytime that somebody wants to break ground on something like that, the first thing they're accused is you've got to be crazy. You look at some of the, 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 uh, the, the most uh, peaceful, the, the, most, uh, the leaders of peace in history. Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr. Everybody thought they were nuts. And some people tried to show the world that they were evil. And that's what they were doing to Christ. But what Christ was showing people about himself was that he was genuine. The thing that shook them up the most is that Christ was being himself. As much as people tried to get him to alter to change, to close in, to put a different front on himself, Christ remained true to who he was. He refused to yield. Christ was genuine. What you saw in Jesus was Jesus. What you saw Jesus when he was in the church, you saw Jesus. When you saw Jesus walking in the field, you saw Jesus. When you saw Jesus annoyed as his fellow disciples, you saw Jesus. He was genuine to himself and to others. Even when it made him uncomfortable. That's when I remember in the beginning when I said that we try to be like Christ. 
We're, we miss the boat on that sometimes because we don't like to make people uncomfortable. We, we try to act a certain way in a certain place. You know, when I, when I, when I meet with uh, my, my bosses at the district and stuff, I try to act professional and like a pastor. <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I, I say things, you know, and try to explain what we're doing here. But I don't need to do that. I don't do it here. Who you see is who I am. Uh, sometimes when I'm in family and I meet certain family members, uh, I act a certain way. To when I meet other people, I act a different way. If I'm um, at, a, at a club, <laughs> I don't go to clubs. <laughs> If, I, if I'm at a club, please get me out. You, then you can say, we have to come get him, he's nuts. If I, there are times when you act a certain way because you don't want to let that guard down. The worst thing that we do, though, the worst time that we do that is when we do it to ourselves. Sometimes we try to deny ourselves of who we are, of what we feel, what we believe. Sometimes we don't want to be uh, a person that admits that they are afraid, angry. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we are unhappy. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we are fragile. Sometimes we don't want to show the world who we are and we begin by denying it ourselves of who we are. And sometimes we put up things that try to make us look stronger. Strength and power is the biggest, is the biggest illusion that we have on earth today, in my, in, in my belief. Because everything that we fight for comes out of insecurity, of not having enough strength or power. And we continue to try to build strength and power. We try to either be the coolest person by dressing whatever the way they dress today, those kids today. We try to fit in because we don't want to be made fun of by the way that we dress. Um, we change our, our, our hairstyles. We change uh, the cars we drive. We change the, the, even the, the music we listen to. Some of the pop culture references we try to stay on board with because we don't want to be weak in knowledge of what's cool today. And sometimes we try to put up even a, a bigger front of being a uh, tough guy, you know. Um, it used to be a, a gender thing, tough guy. That's nonsense. Every one of us tries to be strong. We try to be strong. We try to show the world that we are strong. We don't want to show our weakness. Even more so, we even go, it, it, we, it, it hardens the, our actions so much more. We try to be so strong. We try to show less emotion anymore that even in, when we are walking down the street and we see another person walk beside us, we size them up. Tough guy? You tough guy? I'm tougher than you are, just so you know. Now, do I wave at him or do I just ignore him? Because if I wave at him, I might be showing a weakness. If I show him kindness, I might actually be showing a little bit of a weakness. I want to wave at him. I want to show that kindness. Because that's who I am. One of my favorite... Is it too, late to, too early to talk Christmas? I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. One of my favorite stories around Christmas is A Christmas Carol. Uh, I love this movie. I love the movies. Uh, I watch different versions of them. There's actually a, a cartoon version in, on, made in like 1972. It's like an hour long, and it is scary. Uh, for a cartoon, for drawings to just scare you, that one does. But it's the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, and he is a person that hates the world. He's a money. Uh, we often talk about just the money. You know, he's, he loves greed and all of that kind of stuff. And he uh, meets uh, three ghosts. The ghost of the past, the ghost of the present, the ghost of the future. 
And the climax is when he figures out that he is going to die. And he gets so scared of that that he changes his heart. And that's not really the story. The story is that the ghosts show him who he really is. The story is about a person not being genuine to themselves. When the ghost of the Christmas past visits him, takes him to his past, we see this young Ebenezer Scrooge feeling lonely and afraid because his family has not come and gotten him. We see trouble with relationships. We see hurt feelings. And you see the beginning of Tough Guy starting to come up. Nowhere does he talk about this stuff. Nowhere does he tell his parents, I'm afraid. Instead, we see Tough Guy building up. Tough Guy. And he finds out that he can build this shell around him and this circle around him where no one ever has to talk to him about his feelings or get to know him. And he realizes that money is power, so he grabs hold of that to keep distance from me to you and to push you away because you're not going to hurt me. I am tough guy. And we start to see the real Ebenezer drift away. And the facade is given energy. Then they take him to the present, and they show what a jerk he is. Because tough guy is in full form here. Now he's old tough, tough guy, rich tough guy. His partner, his one friend, is gone. All he has left is tough guy, and he has pushed everybody, so he's been very successful at pushing everybody away. But what they show him are other people in his life not being tough guys. They show Bob Cratchit. A guy that is himself in front of his family. A guy that is not threatened by other people. As a matter of fact, he encourages the family to pray for this Ebenezer tough guy. And then we see Tiny Tim saying, God bless us, everyone. Because Tiny Tim is not tough guy. Tiny Tim is genuine to himself and to the words of Christ. God bless us, everyone. We go to the future, and we see the grave scene where you got just this uh, thing in the cloak there pointing fingers and stuff and doesn't talk to him and just shows him that nobody cares that he's dead and then, then takes him to the grave and he sees his name on there, Ebenezer Scrooge. And he falls to his knees and he prays that these are not the, the things that are definite going to happen, but things that might happen, but that he gives the chance to change. He's not scared of dying. He's scared of running out of time to ever be himself. The reason that that climax turn is so easy is because Ebenezer Scrooge, the genuine Ebenezer Scrooge, has always been there. The child that is fearful. The child that is joyful. The child that wants to be loved. The child that wants to love. He doesn't want to die that way. And so the ghost gives him another chance. You see, oftentimes we can kind of do this to ourselves. Who is the genuine you? Who is the honest you? Is there anything that you're hiding from other people or yourself? Is there anything that you should be talking about? Because by not talking about it, it's putting up walls. Are you being genuine to yourself? Are you building up like a, I'm not saying that there's a Scrooge here, but I am saying that a lot of us have built up walls here and we've acted out on certain things because we're trying to protect other things. I think the reason I love Scrooge so much is because my story is very much like Scrooge. Very much like Scrooge. I was a jerk. For a good part of my life, I was a jerk. I was uh, doing a lot of things wrong. And in order to straighten that out, what I had to do is I had to take a look at my past. And then I had to take a look at my present. And then I had to take a look at my future. 
I had to walk through my past and see where was the times when I was hurt or where, where were the things that I needed to talk about. In my family, there was abuse and things like that. I had to address that because I found out that I was carrying that little child with me for a long time. But I, I became a tough guy. I had to address the present to see how I was acting about that. What was I doing to defend myself against all of those feelings inside? And then I had to look at the future to see where this was going to take me. And it was going to take me where Ebenezer Scrooge was, probably to the grave. Definitely to the grave. To the grave without making amends. To the grave with still people hurt by my actions. And still to the grave without making contact or friendships where I wanted to. Absence of love. Another favorite movie of mine is It's a Wonderful Life. That's actually my favorite movie of all time. I am a sappy dork. <laughs> because the reason I love this movie is because he was the same way. George Bailey. He was angry. And all he needed to show was not only his past, present, and future, but how life would be like without him. Because whether we're a tough guy or not, whether we try to put up walls or not, we have people in this world that love us. We always will, that care about us. We can try to push them away, and sometimes we're pretty successful at pushing people away. But even Ebenezer Scrooge had people praying for him. We can try to be as disingenuous as, as we want, or we can show people our honest self. Sometimes I feel like we are all uh, born and we just start taking off. And things happen to us in the world, in our path, and we, we start to drift farther away from, from home. Home. Home is the heart. Home, home is, is, is what we have inside. Remember I said every one of us has that Holy Spirit in us? Every one of us does. And we spend a lot of our lives trying to run from it. The more genuine we are, the closer we get to home. I invite us this Thanksgiving weekend to think about home. What do I need to do to get closer to it? Would you pray with me? Lord, we, we seek our honest selves. There's an old saying that the greatest gift you can give anybody is the gift of your true, honest self. I believe that's also the gift that we can give ourselves. Help us to find out who we are. If there's anything that we're doing that is not true to us, if we're hating somebody because we're truly out of fear, if we're pushing people away because we're scared, if we're acting happy when we're sad, if we don't ask for help when we need it. Whatever the case may be, help us to be brave, brave enough to be humble enough. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You took my pride, you took my shame, you took it all just yesterday. And I asked you when you came again to my side with your arms open wide. You said, welcome home, you'll never be alone, and I'll stay by your side till the end of time. said, welcome home, you will never be alone, and I'll stay by your side till the end of time. 
Welcome home, child. Welcome home. Be with me now, wherever I would roam, to the dusty fields or the open road, to the big city where they forgot your name. May the forgiveness you gave be theirs just the same. Welcome home, child. Welcome home. Welcome home, child. Day finally comes when the dead will rise and we'll ride on clouds to paradise. There will be no more death, there will be no more pain, there will be no more night, there will be no more shame, there will be no more war, there will be no more fear, there will be only love and hate will disappear. On the thief will be chained up. God, you will rain down. The thief will be chained up. God, you will rain down. The thief will be chained up. And God, you will rain down. Welcome home. What album is that on? Uh, love isn't what you would expect. Life isn't what you would love. expect? Love. Love what? isn't what you would expect. Oh, love isn't what you would expect. Okay. And, and how many albums ago was that for you? He has seven just, albums out, just, if you will. One, one before. One before. And I, I, uh, I have that album, and I've been begging him to sing that song for uh, several months now. And uh, he, he's been a little uh, nervous about it. Can I say that? Nervous about it? I'm, I'm telling your genuineness here, because yeah. he's, he's never performed that song live before. I thought he did a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, I also want to do a plug. Uh, Ryan yesterday played at um, Art and Soul. It's around like 56 and Pine, Pine Lake. Yeah. yeah. It's where Campbell's is, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And for the rest of the year, he's going to be playing there every Saturday night. And so and would some Christmas songs too. and some Christmas songs, yeah. So I'd love to invite you guys to do that. He's also going to be uh, with Santa singing Christmas songs when we have that there too. So um, I'm hoping he'll dress like an elf because I think. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that would be funny. <laughs> Welcome home. God's not up there. God, God is not not distant. God is here, and this proves it right here. Uh, this was not a clean meal. This was a dirty meal. Things were about to happen to God. Things were about to happen to Jesus. He was going to be taken away. It was going to be bloody. It was going to be a mess. He knew that. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't hoity-toity. The wine probably had bugs in it. Who knows? But what he said was, be part of this. Come as you are. Church is not about us or them. It's about us all being a mess. It's about us all trying to figure it out. It's about us all wanting to feel loved. That's an invitation for everybody. And that's what Christ was trying to tell us by this. Can I have a volunteer to help me serve communion? Oh, Lorenzo, thank you. He does such a great job at this. Thank you, sir. Take that there. I'll give you that. We do this by intinction, which means we dip. You're going to say, body of Christ given to you. Can you say that? Body of Christ is given for you. Perfect. And she's going to say, blood of Christ is given for you. Blood of Christ is given for you. And then we enjoy it. We don't believe that this is the body of Christ or the blood of Christ. It's symbolic. It means that Christ died for us because Christ welcomed us home. Christ welcomed us as we are for who we are. 
That's genuineness. As we take this, I hope that we celebrate that community of genuineness, meaning that he and I are different and yet the same. Both of us have feelings. Both of us have wonderment. Even our age difference doesn't separate the feelings that we have about this world. We both laugh. We both cry. Let us, let us show that and share that and understand that with ourselves and with our neighbor. You can come up whenever you can. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour Toils and snares we have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. Oh, now when we been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. I love sitting up here. You guys should sit up here and listen to you guys sing. Well, I guess if you were sitting up here, you wouldn't hear it, but it's, you guys sound so great. Um, next Sunday will be the final uh, thing in our ser series here. I don't know if you call it episodes or what do you call it? I'm not a pastor. I am a pastor. I don't know what it is. Um, but we're going to talk about discouragement because our value is advocacy. So we're going to talk about how we can advocate for people, how we can advocate for ourselves. And we're also going to talk a little bit about gratitude in there because it is Thanksgiving weekend. And just a reminder, we can't meet here, so we're going to do a sneak peek in the space. Bring a lawn chair and uh, join us. Bring a friend. When you leave here this week, 
whether, whatever your Thanksgiving plans are, I know a lot of us, we spend time with family or we do stuff. Show them your honest self. Take that risk. And start off by introducing that to yourself. And then you can even talk to them about Jesus. That'll end a conversation sometimes pretty quick. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. Enjoy yourself and enjoy the weekend and drive safe. I'm in.